We have some incredible gravitational wave detectors here on Earth. They're made up of L-shaped arms that are each 3 or 4 kilometers long, and along these arms shine incredibly powerful lasers. Using these machines, we're able to detect teeny tiny stretches of space-time caused by some of the most violent events in the universe. Black holes are the densest objects we know of, and with that come some almighty gravitational forces. If we start with a couple of black holes, each about 20 times more massive than the sun, then if these black holes were to meet in space, they would end up orbiting each other, accelerating around their common center of mass. While this might sound like a gentle meet-cute, since the black holes are so dense, it actually causes ripples to spread out from these in-spiraling black holes. These ripples are called gravitational waves, and they stretch and squeeze space-time, the fabric of the universe itself, and everything in it as they travel through the universe. The gravitational waves carry energy away from the orbiting black holes, causing them to fall towards each other and eventually merge. The waves become bigger and more energetic as the merger approaches, and the very last moments cause waves that we can detect here on Earth. These gravitational waves were actually predicted a hundred years ago by Einstein's general theory of relativity, but it took us a hundred years to build a machine sensitive enough to detect them. The stretching of space-time also stretches the laser arms of these detectors, changing the lengths of the arms just enough to see changes in the lasers we shine down them. This allows us to see the final moments of merging black holes, or even the final in-spiral of merging neutron stars too. LIGO has two detectors in the USA, each with arms that are four kilometers each, and Virgo has a detector in Italy with three kilometer long arms. So far, these detectors, along with help from the Japanese one Kagra, have been able to feel the gravitational waves of over a hundred pairs of merging black holes and neutron stars. Each time, they can point from the stretching they felt to an individual merger of two dense bodies. However, if the mergers happen too far away, and they involve supermassive black holes, then the gravitational waves will actually be too weak by the time they reach Earth. These events might involve supermassive black holes that are hundreds of millions of times more massive than our Sun. The issue is that when supermassive black holes merge, they orbit each other much slower, and emit gravitational waves of a much lower frequency, and it might take millions of years for them to finally actually merge. The waves made here will be too weak or low frequency to be detected on Earth, but if there are enough of them, then combined, they should be able to produce a big enough signal to be seen. We call this signal a gravitational wave background, or sometimes a stochastic gravitational wave background. Stochastic here just means random, but us physicists use it when we want to sound more sophisticated than the word random suggests itself. Since there are so many sources contributing to the background, its signal can look like random fluctuations, hence its name, but we can see it as a real signal, in addition and on top of any noise the detectors might have. That background would always be there, churning away space. It's similar to the cosmic microwave background, but instead of light, it's made up of distant gravitational wave events. Potentially millions of pairs of supermassive black holes in the very distant universe could be in the process of merging, contributing to the gravitational wave background. If that's not cool, I don't know what is. It's a constant pulse, stretching everything around us by imperceivably small amounts all the time a gravitational dance that the naked eye can't notice. It will be impossible to resolve the individual sources and events that make up the background, but we should see their combined effect. However, this might not be possible with LIGO, and instead might require detectors with even longer arms. This would be pretty much impossible to do on Earth, and so we turn to space for this. It might be possible to use the future LISA mission to do this. It will feature three spacecraft flying in a triangle, using lasers that stretch two and a half million kilometers to detect gravitational waves. This means that LISA is able to detect longer wavelength gravitational waves than LIGO, Virgo, or CAGRA, and makes it perfect for detecting things like merging supermassive black holes, and possibly for detecting a gravitational wave background too. The waves that make up the background are likely to have been redshifted, that's stretched by the expanding universe, to the longer wavelengths that LISA could see. The cool thing though is that we might not even need to wait for LISA, 
which won't even launch until the late 2030s. Instead, we might be able to use our entire galaxy as a natural gravitational wave detector. We can do this using pulsars, some of the most exotic objects in the universe, and they're scattered throughout the Milky Way. Pulsars are neutron stars, ultra-dense balls of pure neutrons that can form when massive stars end their life in a supernova explosion. Not all neutron stars are pulsars, but all pulsars are neutron stars. A neutron star with a powerful enough magnetic field can funnel matter and electromagnetic radiation towards its magnetic poles, where it's then blasted out into space in a powerful jet. Think of them as nature's brightest flashlights, shining so powerfully that they can be seen from across the universe. The thing is, neutron stars also tend to rotate in incredibly fast, so we end up with a jet that's also processing really fast. This is what we call a pulsar, because if the jet passes over the Earth, then we can see it as a pulse of light every time it hits us during the rotation. They're like lighthouses, visible only when the light hits us directly. The thing that's even more impressive about pulsars is that their rotation is incredibly stable, and they essentially act as ultra-precise clocks, each pulse acting like a tick of the clock. They have very short times between the pulses of light though, usually just a few milliseconds, but this is what lets us use them as nature's own gravitational wave detectors. As a result, pulsars are incredibly useful to us astronomers, and in fact, they were even used in the very first detection of an exoplanet back in 1992. But that is a story for another video. If a gravitational wave passes through the path of the pulsar's light, then that path could be stretched or squeezed a tiny amount, meaning the light arrival time changes slightly because it has to travel a shorter or longer distance to reach us. This means that changes in the timings of the flashing lights of the pulsar can be used to detect gravitational waves. If there's a longer than usual gap between pulses, then that could have been caused by the dance of a million pairs of supermassive black holes merging in the distant universe. Now, one pulsar isn't enough to do this with. The timing changes are incredibly small, and how could we know that it wasn't caused by some measurement error of our clock, or even something internal to the pulsar itself causing a glitch in the rotation? Maybe it lost a bit of energy and slowed down slightly, or maybe it was hit by some other event causing the change. The true power of all of this comes from having many of these pulsars in what we call a pulsar timing array, or PTA. There are a few teams around the world monitoring pulsar arrays using the largest telescopes on the planet, and together they form the IPTA, or International Pulsar Timing Array. They work together monitoring dozens of pulsars, and the goal is to see changes in the timings across the whole array. For example, the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, Nanograv, currently monitors 68 pulsars. Seeing one flicker slightly off time isn't enough, but seeing tens of them all change by about the same amount at about the same time, now that is something. Then, doing this consistently over many years has allowed the teams to build up statistical significance to these events, and gain a better understanding of whether they can really see this gravitational wave background. Hopefully, we might be able to see a real detection of this signal very soon. While we expect merging supermassive black holes to be the major source of this background, they probably aren't the only thing contributing to it. Other processes, like quantum fluctuations immediately after the Big Bang, early universe inflation where the universe grew by an enormous amount in a fraction of a second, or even cosmic strings colliding, could also cause low-frequency gravitational waves. As a result, a detection of this background might allow us to start probing this physics better than we can at the moment. Expect to see a lot of theoretical papers to be released if we see a background detection, as they all claim to explain it perfectly with their favourite theories. Despite that, the size of the waves of the background and their frequency will begin to give us clues to things like the numbers and distribution of the supermassive black holes, and it can tell us about their masses too we might get a better idea of exactly what might happen when the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Andromeda galaxy finally merges with the one at the centre of our own galaxy in a few billion years or so. And it will allow us to see if general relativity continues to be the best theory for explaining all things gravity. Perhaps GR won't be able to predict the exact signal we see, or perhaps it will. Let's wait and see on that one. Leave any questions or comments you have about all of this in the comments below, and thanks for watching.
Until next time, stay safe, team. I'll see you soon. Bye.